With the concept of face, Irving Goffman gives us a very useful way of thinking about the variety of expectations that we encounter in every communicative interaction. At the same time, face work, the essay that you've read for this week's class, it doesn't give a set of prescriptive rules about what you ought to do in any situation. There are books like that, and I tend to find them to be a little bit suspect because anyone that's going to tell you that there are certain rules that work in every situation is probably selling you a bill of goods. It's unlikely that any set of rules like that is going to do anything other than give you a narrow and a brittle kind of persona that's not going to work in any situation, and it might give you a false sense of confidence. Rather, we need a supple way of analyzing the complexities. And phase work is one way that I think that can help us understand both what is happening in a social interaction when things are going right and some of the ways that things go wrong. So the essay that you've read has a bunch of concepts that are unfamiliar and terms that are have to be defined. The first two come right early in the essay. The first is a line. Coffin defines this as a pattern of verbal and nonverbal acts by which someone expresses their view of the situation. And through this evaluation of the participants, especially themselves, a line is a pattern of verbal and nonverbal acts that someone uses to express their view of the situation and of the participants including themselves. One line that you might take is being the clown. Maybe in a group of friends, you're the person who's going to supply their humor. And that means that you have a evaluation of the situation that shows that a certain kind of humor is expected of you. Maybe it fills in the gaps between other relationships that are don't go so well together. There's all sorts of complexity about those relationships. Another line that you might take might be the good listener, right? So you might be someone who's just kind of focused in an interaction on trying to listen carefully and not contribute too much of your own. So there's huge and infinite variety of different lines that you might take in any situation, and we don't need to go through and try to classify them. But basically, the line is the pattern of actions that gives some consistency to who we are in an interaction. Now, that seems weird to us. Why would I be inconsistent? It's me, right? Well, that's part of what is useful about the concept of face work. We're not initially assuming that people act consistently because sometimes they don't. And even if we like to think that we act consistently, maybe other people don't think that we do all the time. And maybe even some we have disagreements about when we do. However, unlike the concept of the line, which is that kind of pattern that one is consciously taking, face is a slightly different concept. Face is positive social value a person effectively claims by taking the line others assume that you are taking in some particular interaction. And so the idea of the line, that actual pattern that you are consciously taking, is a little different than the face, which is what other people recognize you to be doing. And it's sometimes that mismatch between what people see you doing and the approach that you're actually taking that leads to some pathologies of communication. But that concept of the face is something that is fundamentally social. It's something that's recognized by what we could call in this class an audience. And so face is similar to what I've called in the lecture on register, the persona. And in fact, you can hear in the word face, and if you remember the etymology of the word persona, which relates to mask, a similar idea. So once again, we see this a similar idea of persona, a face that one kind of puts on in order to maintain that rhetorical stance of your relationship to the audience and your relationship to the thing you're talking about, but also to yourself. How you're representing yourself becomes a choice in various situations. Because we have these feelings about our face, it might seem that interactions with people are all just uh, a way of everyone kind of defending their own image of themselves. But Kaufman's view isn't really that. We have feelings that allow, want us to both protect and defend our own face and the line that we're taking in interaction, but also defend others. And so people will try to uh, tend to uh, try to accommodate each other in social situations, even if they see something going poorly. I can tell you a little anecdote about that. I was in Japan and I was in a, 
Hokkaido, the uh, Sapporo, the northernmost island in Japan. And we were picked up from the airport. I was there doing a tour about debate. We were picked up from the airport by a very nice man. And as we were driving, we had a long drive to from the airport. And he was just telling us some things about Japanese culture and what we would be encountering in Hokkaido. As he was doing this, one of the things he mentioned was the traditional Zen art of flower arrangement. My companion, who was from Texas, said, oh, we have flower arrangement too in Texas. We call them bouquets. Now, the Zen art of flower arrangement is a highly requires a great deal of training and requires a lot of practice of a ceremonial nature that is difficult to describe. I'm I'm not sure that I am capable of describing it. But in comparing Zen flower arrangement to bouquets, of which assuredly there, you know, there is an art to the arrangement of a bouquet, there is a little bit of a loss of face. I don't believe that the person saying it knew that, but our our driver um accommodated her by saying something along the lines of, oh, I would love to go to Texas and and see some of the flower arrangements that you have there, allowing the situation to kind of continue. And he just went on continuing with uh, telling us some information rather than making it an embarrassing situation in which he said, oh, well, bouquets are nothing like what, what we do. So he didn't do anything like that. Of course not. So the, uh, the, I, desire for people to kind of allow you to keep face in a situation is both a rhetorical benefit. It means that when you get up to speak and when people in the moment, people don't want you to fail. People want you to succeed. It's going to make them uncomfortable if you don't do a good job speaking. If things go really badly, people are going to be like, no, it's okay. But there's also a little bit of a cause to that rhetorically, which is people aren't going to be completely forward with you if something is wrong in your message, or if they disagree with something, they're probably not going to come right up to you and say it. And so that's one of the reasons we have to do all this audience work, because audience work is not going to be done by face work. All of the face work is kind of working to keep everything in the moment intact. So in audience work, we're trying to think about, well, what are the possibilities of what people might be thinking otherwise? What kind of inferences are possible here? And I want to do that as deeply in my preparation for a speech before I get there, people may clap no matter what, but I want to make sure that people are really engaged in my speech and not just being polite. Towards the end of the essay, Goffman expresses two concepts of self. He talks about the self as an image pieced together from the expressive implications of the full flow of events. That's the kind of self that's attending to everything that's happening, what you get from listening and piecing things together. But there's also the self, as he calls it, that's a player in a ritual game and that kind of scripted social game that exists. And there's all different kinds of social scripts that we are often unconsciously using. Sometimes they're very obvious ones of uh, the the social script of the greeting or of the of taking leave. But sometimes you can know how these can go these can go wrong or someone can make a variation on a social script. For instance, I always remember growing up at family parties when a certain aunt of mine was there, I knew that it really wasn't going to be over until she left because she was going to talk maybe an hour or two longer, even after everyone else had gone. So I could knew I didn't have to go to bed yet. So some people have different ways of reading that, but they can kind of play that into their persona. We would just call that aunt and another uncle of mine talkers. They're silver tongue. They have the gift of gap, and it kind of became part of their persona and became accepted, and other people accommodated it, even though for everyone else, anyone else doing that, it might seem like, wow, this person's really pushing the limit of what's an acceptable amount of time to stay at somebody else's house. We again see, towards the end of the essay, something very similar to what Booth talks about in the rhetorical stance, ways that things can go wrong. He talks about if there's too much perceptiveness, if someone's too perceptive to a situation uh, that it becomes they become almost oversensitive that there's not enough kind of give in the rules that the person's like oh wow you're 
you're really, you know all of the rules of the situation, but actually if you enforce all of the rules of a social situation, it becomes impossible to negotiate and to manage. There needs to be a little bit of leeway for people to have successful communicative interactions. At the same time, if there's too little perceptiveness, someone might come across as being really aggressive or even threatening. If someone doesn't, or, or just inconsiderate, if someone doesn't not, not perceiving what's happening with other people in a situation. At the same time, you might have be perceptive enough, but you might have almost too much savoir faire. You might be too good at kind of accommodating everyone in every situation. And this seems like a strange problem, but it's one I like to think about. It's almost if, if being the problem of being too polished. In a lot of interactions, someone who never makes any mistake and is always accommodating can, in some cultures, come off as being not fully worthy of trust. They don't feel fully human. They feel almost robotic. Um, so even if someone's not doing it in a way that, that feels robotic, maybe they just seem uh, really smooth. That that feeling of smoothness of someone who always says the right thing, even that can be off-putting to people of saying like, wow, that, I don't really have any sense of where I stand with that person because they always say the right thing. So that can seem kind of anxiety provoking when you put it that way. Even if I do all the right things, it can be bad. But most of us kind of live in the middle. You try to be more perceptive. You try to see what's going on in a situation. You um, are you try to make sure that you have the right set of repertoire in order to adapt to the various interactions between your face and others in a situation. And that means that you have to develop rhetorical skills. You need to have a little bit of a repertoire. You need to be able to be practiced in how to accommodate various demands of a situation. But if you overplay your hand, if you're almost too good at it, people might not know how to interact with you. They might feel uh, threatened or out of their league communicatively. So I like to, as I've mentioned in a previous video, talk about the loose grip as a potential kind of goal that you might go for, which is developing that rhetorical repertoire of how do I accommodate all these various potential situations, but not being so upset if things don't go perfectly well and kind of allowing myself to own some of those mistakes, making sure that I'm, that I can just kind of laugh at myself a little bit or uh, let people in on the fact that I'm aware of a mistake that I've made. And that can be very humanizing and really important too. So the point is to make sure that we are developing a repertoire of rhetorical skills to attend to what's necessary in any rhetorical situation, but not to freak out if you make a mistake. That actually can be part of developing a successful persona in many communicative situations. Because we have these feelings about our face, it might seem that interactions with people are all just uh, a way of everyone kind of defending their own image of themselves. But Kaufman's view isn't really that. We have feelings that allow, want us to both protect and defend our own face and the line that we're taking in interaction, but also defend others. And so people will try to uh, tend to uh, try to accommodate each other in social situations, even if they see something going poorly. I can tell you a little anecdote about that. I was in Japan and I was in uh, Hokkaido, the, uh, Sapporo, the northernmost island in Japan. And we were picked up from the airport. I was there doing a tour about debate. We were picked up from the airport by a very nice man. And as we were driving, we had a long drive to from the airport. And he was just telling us some things about Japanese culture and what we would be encountering in Hokkaido. As he was doing this, one of the things he mentioned was the traditional Zen art of flower arrangement. My companion, who was from Texas, said, oh, we have flower arrangement too in Texas. We call them bouquets. Now, the Zen art of flower arrangement is a highly, requires a great deal of training and requires a lot of practice of a ceremonial nature that is difficult to describe. I'm, I'm not sure that I am capable of describing it. But in comparing Zen flower arrangement to bouquets, of which assuredly there, you know, there is an art to the arrangement of a bouquet, 
there was a little bit of a loss of face. I don't believe that the person saying it knew that, but our, our driver um, ala- accommodated her by saying something along the lines of, oh, I would love to go to Texas and, and see some of the flower arrangements that you have there, allowing the situation to kind of continue. And he just went on continuing with uh, telling us some information rather than making it an embarrassing situation in which he said, oh, well, bouquets are nothing like what, what we do. So he didn't do anything like that. Of course not. So the, uh, the I, desire for people to kind of allow you to keep face in a situation is both a rhetorical benefit. It means that when you get up to speak and when people speak, in the moment, people don't want you to fail. People want you to succeed. It's going to make them uncomfortable if you don't do a good job speaking. If things go really badly, people are going to be like, no, it's okay. But there's also a little bit of a cause to that rhetorically, which is people aren't going to be completely forward with you if something is wrong in your message or if they disagree with something. They're probably not going to come right up to you and say it. And so that's one of the reasons we have to do all this audience work because audience work is not going to be done by face work. All of the face work is kind of working to keep everything in the moment intact. So in audience work, we're trying to think about, well, what are the possibilities of what people might be thinking otherwise? What kind of inferences are possible here? And I want to do that as deeply in my preparation for a speech before I get there. People may clap no matter what, but I want to make sure that people are really engaged in my speech and not just being polite.